Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, uh, Deborah, for the opportunity to just to speak to you. Um, I've been giving this talk uh, a lot, uh, although I, I will be giving it uh, a lot by the time uh, the, the summer's here, uh, as a result of the increased number of, of uh, presentations that we're doing with uh, what we call what Deborah's organizing as the American Vineyard Foundation Regional Road Shows. So uh, if anybody were in Paso the other day, sorry, <laughs> you're going to get the same talk. And if you're going to Lodi in a week or so, you might see the same thing again. Um, but I, and I want to stop right here and just say uh, the, the acknowledgement slide that I forgot to put in, which I usually do for every talk, we all try to do for every talk, is to acknowledge the funding from the American Vineyard Foundation, the Viticulture Consortium, which is USDA funds, so federal funds, and what we call the CCG, the California Competitive Grant Program in Viticulture and Enology, which are state funds. So we have private funds, federal funds, and state funds coming together. And some years we get different mixes, so I just acknowledge all of them all the time. I uh, want to thank uh, Deborah Galino and her staff, Sue Sim, uh, 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 Susan Nelson Kluke, uh, Adib Rohani, and others who have been in instrumental in getting uh, some portions of this experiment uh, up and running. I um, want to thank uh, them for that. And of course, Mike Anderson and Jason Benz, the technical staff that help uh, take all of the data and, and the presentations, the statistics, et cetera. Um, so I want to thank everyone uh, who's been involved. I'm going to make this talk. It's going to be a little bit shorter than 30 minutes, so it would get us a little bit back on track. Um, Deborah already went over this, so I won't go back over it. Uh, we're obviously interested in documenting a lot of things about clones. Uh, these are some of the things we're interested in. Obviously, uh, this is the hardest one, the bottom one here, the wine quality attributes. And by the way, I don't think this pointer shows up that well, so I'll try to indicate where I'm pointing. Um, but uh, we obviously are interested in lots of things. Uh, cluster architecture is one that we don't pay that much attention to, really. Most places that have rot potential, like uh, Europe, do pay a lot of attention to that. And there's a great graph uh, in the first Cool Climate uh, book uh, that shows differences in Pinot Noir uh, rot as a result of cluster architecture. And, and uh, I'd be happy to point you to that if you, if you have never seen that. Um, of course, this is the kind of thing that we see. This is a Cabernet talk, but this happened to be this a Chardonnay photo that I had in the, in the file. Uh, on, on your left is the uh, super clone, if you will, Cabernet, I'm sorry, Chardonnay 4. Um, but the interesting thing about this is if you were to compare not just 4 against 16, but if you look at the berry uniformity in this cluster on the left, compared to, you can see a couple of examples, these two right here at the top. Talk to Waterhouse has given us a um, pointer that really... Thank you. Thanks, Andy. I think I lost the last one you gave me, so you better be careful with this one, I guess. But is that any better? Anyway, um, so uh, so again, very size differences, uh, uniformity size differences, are uh, one of the things that we see. So in this particular trial, um, I'm going to make another mention of this, but just to make a mention now that whenever you set up a clonal trial, everybody's interested in the stuff that comes after you set the trial up, unfortunately. So it seems like whenever we get to a point of actually having uh, uh, old enough finds to take data and about three or four years worth of data, everybody's interested in the things that came in down the road after that. But I'll, I'll give you a graph in a second about which 12 clones we did, but just to let you know that we, of course, do them in replicated fashion. Uh, we're about, uh, what's that, uh, so six feet by, uh, by, by eight. Uh, rootstock is 10114 VSP bilateral cordon. Uh, we pruned to about 12 shoots uh, per, per meter. Um, and uh, we took the average of three years, which is 2005 through 2007. Um, Deborah went over this list, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I will make a couple of contrasts in the data between this line right here, 14 and up, because we have some experience previously with these selections in other trials and other places. And essentially, to my knowledge, the 24 through 31, this is the first data uh, Deborah presented the contrast of the uh, virus infected versus virus free materials. We'll just spend our time on the virus free ones. And then some data on 161, I'm sorry, 169 from France. Um, but again, I'm going to make some, some uh, uh, comparisons of what we have typically seen uh, with these uh, 14 and, and, and uh, under uh, clones versus the, versus the other one. So we've had in trial before with uh, Mark Cleaver uh, many years ago at Oakville, 2, 6, and 8. Um, and we have had at, at uh, a trial in Lodi, uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 14, amongst others. We've actually had five in there as well. But the pattern we see here is typical of what we've seen before. The highest yielding of this 14 and under is the 14 at about 3.4. So these Chilean selections tend to be more high yielding. We've tended to see that uh, time and time again. 
Um, Cabernet 8 is the sort of, we call that our high yielding one, but that's the high yielding of the, of the, the more widely used uh, selections. That comes in at about 2.9. And then 2 and 4 tend to group together a little bit. About here, about 2%, I'm sorry, 10% under uh, Cabernet uh, 8, which again, we call that our standard, the more of the more widely planted selections is that Concanon 7 and 8. Uh, and that's again what we see. Sometimes it's a little bit more than 10%, uh, but uh, this is not atypical of what we've seen before. And then bringing up the, the, the rear for these first uh, five selections is uh, Clone 6. That's the Jackson selection. Even when you actually look at the, P the Pinot Noirs that also come from that Jackson uh, ranch, they're also uh, fairly low yielding. So I don't know if that's characteristic of that very, very uh, old planting from the 1880s. Uh, but at any rate, that's what we see. So about 60% of the yield of, of Cabernet 8 is where 6 usually comes in. Um, typically, we have not seen so much difference in the cluster number. Uh, typically, it's been more cluster weight, but we do see a little bit of difference in cluster number. But again, as uh, Glenn mentioned, uh, the other people may have mentioned, when we, when we prune these to a set number of shoots per meter, that pretty much sets uh, the, uh, the, the, the cluster number. Uh, and what we can see here is that much of that difference now is due to cluster weight and grams. Um, and berries per cluster is the primary driver of that, although in this case, berry weight uh, is involved. And I'll show you some of those data very quickly in just a second. So now from 24 on down, a couple of the things you can see is that we tend to have some that are the higher yielding ones. So FPS 27 looking more like 14. Uh, we have 24, 26 uh, in that group of, say, middle yielding, so slightly uh, around uh, the 2.4, a little bit under uh, Cabernet 8. Uh, and that's about all we can say about them right now. We didn't take a whole lot more data that would characterize them in any way. But I'll go back to what Deborah said, which is the, the more interesting ones here, these heritage selections, is that FPS 29 and 30 acting maybe more like uh, 8, uh, about, about 3 kilos or, or slightly uh, thereabouts. But it's this FPS 31, which is very interesting. In fact, slightly, not significantly, uh, even a little bit lower than, than FPS 6. Uh, and again, here too, also the cluster number is very interesting. So it raises a question, which, uh, which our French colleague uh, maybe has, has given some um, uh, encouragement for the idea that maybe one day we'll try to be able to tell whether these are truly different or not, or maybe they're reselections of the same thing uh, uh, going forward. So we'll see. Um, so again, uh, about one gram uh, berries, 0.9 grams to one gram berries. Um, and that, so the, there's a lot of good correlation usually between uh, berries per cluster and cluster weight uh, uh, for, for Cabernet. So here again, there's this list of clones. There's the berry weight, bricks, T, uh, PHTA. Uh, not a lot of interesting stuff going on. The pH is as typical for our Oakville plot, even though the, the bricks levels are pretty high. The pH is still very, uh, very, very fine uh, in about uh, six and a half to seven uh, grams of acid. And again, a lot of uniformity in the berry size here. We do see FPS 6, as I mentioned, a little bit lower, but by and large, 0.9 uh, to 1. So most of the interest is in the berries per cluster, and that's leading to cluster weight, which is leading to the yield difference. <clears throat> well, it's a bit of a dilemma that we have in our current understanding. I'm going to uh, separate this talk uh, on, on from where we're just talking about Cabernet clones to some, some issues in general. Um, for this group, I think it's important to know that um, obviously you would prefer to have wines in front of you that represent these clones, but we've uh, not been successful thus far in getting the funding for that, and there's a good reason for that. With all due respect to AVF, and we, we can't thank them enough for their support, AVF has a huge, broad range of issues that it deals with, from pottery mildew to vine mealybug to vine physiology to, uh, to winemaking. Uh, they have a host of, of issues and their money is limited and so when it comes down to to clones and actually varieties as well there's a limited amount of ability that they feel they have a, the way we're interpreting the response uh, to, to do a lot of clonal work clones really aren't the same kind of problem that vine mealybug is and that's understandable and, I, and, and in concert with that uh, foundation and thanks to Deborah Galino and her crew um, is now an efficient effective and active importation and release center for clones and varieties so all that backlog that occurred in the in the 70s and, and 80s when we were doing heat treatment is gone now that Deborah and her crew have put uh, the, uh, the, the the shoot tip culture into place so now they're spitting these things out regularly and clones on the order of probably uh, 10 or more a year and varieties on the order of at least a half a dozen or or a dozen a year 
um, and Deborah has created these wonderful relationships with France and Italy and Spain and getting in some of the minor varieties. Uh, and uh, as, as of course she's mentioned, the Antov group in France has been active in bringing more of those materials in. So we have this, this difference between lots of things coming through and, and a lack of, of available funds to really do much about it. So we're, we're doing what we can. We're going to try to look around this next year or two and see if we can't find other sources beyond uh, AVF, try to stop relying so much on them with this sort of wide portfolio of interest that they have in research and try to find a place that might be more focused on just doing clones uh, and, uh, and varieties. And we'll see if we can make that work. Um, here is the example of that. Uh, in fact, this number is wrong. I just by looking at the materials in your packet, uh, and, and I, I'm dated from looking back last year at Deborah's uh, release uh, or her uh, uh, grape list from last uh, fall. Um, really, there's about 15 Cabernets that don't have any data that I'm aware of. About 12 Cabernet Francs, about 15 Merlots. The number's wrong here for Malbec because I didn't include two that are called Cot. So there's five Malbecs three Petit Verdots and two Carmenaires over which I think there's really right now no, no data. Um, and so we've got a big job ahead of us and I think it's important that we get some, at least some basic information about berry weight, cluster weight, that sort of thing, and hopefully we can. Um, I want to spend a, a, a couple minutes, uh, and that's about all, just to, to add, ask and answer a couple of questions. I've given this talk in some form over the last decade, and I said a lot of things which turns out weren't entirely true. Um, and it's that old adage about science is that all you got to do to have something be untrue is do one more experiment. And when you do, sometimes you find out that, well, it doesn't hold all the time. So I want to make that point here by asking a series of questions. Do lower yielding clones show in do lower yielding clones show increased pruning weight? I said before they do, and this is the data that I use. We'll just confine ourselves to this top graph in which we have yield on the axis and pruning weight. And if you look, this is how mountain data, thanks to uh, Drew Johnson, but uh, fosters some data that we took out of Lodi with the L and Oakville with the O, and this is now yield per vine. So what we're really reflecting here in these differences in yield from one site to another is really the vine uh, uh, spacing as opposed to actual yield per acre, although I'm sure that's true for some degree to the Howe Mountain stuff. But one of the things that you can see is it looks like when six yields less than eight, there's a slight bump in pruning weight between eight and six, between eight and six, it seems pretty consistent. So we said, okay, what we're seeing is, is that a lower crop load on the vine gives the vine more, of a, more, more capacity to, to, to grow as a result of that. Here again, we were looking at Merlots before, and we said, boy, we always see that clonate Merlot uh, has the lowest yield, the lowest yield printing weight ratio. And again, if you graph that out here with this being the plot mean for printing weight, this being the plot mean for yield, here's eight. Pruning weight is higher when the yield is lower, and the rest of these are grouped up in this uh, this, this uh, upper left quadrant. So again, we said, okay, well that that again fits the fits the idea that when you have a lower yielding clone, you'll sometimes get a response of the vine, a compensation. Um, we thought we were really smart here too. Here's Malbec that fits that same uh, graph between yield now a tremendous yield difference uh, between these lower yielding clones in the lower set years versus high. Uh, yielding clones in, in good set years, and again we see a, a, a pretty, pretty, actually pretty tight relationship between yield and pruning weight. Uh, and now, Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir for sparkling wine. These are some selections that have never, to this point, had, until we wrote this paper, had they ever been reported on uh, in California. These are ones brought in by Gloria Ferrer. Uh, through the uh, Canada program and then on into Deborah's pro program. And what we can see here, we had a 0.88 uh, R square last time. Now we got 0.19. Uh, and all you got to do is compare something like 521 and 780 here, where the uh, pruning weight is double at exactly the same yield. So not for Pinot Noir does this, does this situation hold. So either it's just the Bordeaux varieties or it's just the Bordeaux varieties that we had looked at so far. So we would have a little caveat when we answer our question is that do lower yielding clones show increased pruning weight? Sometimes, but, but, but not always. So be prepared for that. If you decide to go with six uh, Cabernet or perhaps 31 uh, for you to think about how you might control growth if you do get that growth response. We see it also, by the way, in Pinot Noir 13, uh, low yielding selection that does seem like it wants to, uh, to grow a lot. Uh, but it's not always true. 
is the yield component berries per cluster the driver of yield? I just showed you the Cabernet data, which seems to suggest that it's driven largely by berries per cluster, which drives cluster weight, which drives yield. So we thought, again, we have that pretty much back to our Merlot clone, same plot that I showed you a different kind of uh, expression to the data before. But if you look at yield and see that the yield line going up as berries per cluster goes up, and that we see that although we have a low yielding FPS 8 down here with the triangles, uh, it, occasionally it'll be up a little bit higher for, for, uh, for other, other clones. But we do see that relationship being pretty tight. Actually, 0.93, it's, it's uh, pretty good. 0.97 even, and when we look at back to the Malbec clones, um, with berries per cluster being the primary driver, and it didn't matter whether it was on 110 or 5C rootstock, either rootstock it looked like that, that was the case. So again, we started talking about this and saying it looks like that's the case. Here's our Pinot Noir friends again, and uh, that graph is 0.28, uh, where berries per cluster is really not the major driver of, of yield, and all you have to do, again, would be to start picking examples here to compare uh, one direction or the other, and you'll see that it breaks down pretty fast. Uh, if you don't know how to interpret the R-squared, you can just look at the scatter um, and see that it's really not a very tight relationship at all. So again, Pinot Noir could just be that we see more variability over time with people who've done a lot of selection. They've actually found things that, that vary quite a bit more. Uh, so the answer to that question is, yes, it's true that berries per cluster can be the driver of yield, but it does not seem to be very tight for, for, for Pinot. Is yield correlated with delayed uh, harvest date? In fact, I was interested to note uh, in Larry uh, Hyde's selection that he gifted to, to Foundation that it's called an early, early uh, ripening uh, selection, if I read that right. Um, we were asking that question when we got this kind of data out of our original Pinot Noir trial. That one I was showing you data from was the second Pinot Noir that we did for sparkling. But we're looking at, at bricks uh, versus yield, or we can look at it at days after harvest of the first selection. And what it appears to be is that these are simply yield-related uh, delay in, in, in bricks accumulation. And again, that's what it looked like. We got get some stars here on our R, R squared. Um, and then we see one here. This is a Chardonnay for sparkling wine trial that we did. And we didn't even try to fit a line through this thing. The data are so, so unline-like, uh, I guess you can call it. There's four way up here, which just is totally off, almost off the, off the map, and 72, which was quite a bit different. Uh, and the rest of these, I suppose we could have fit a line to this, but it uh, didn't seem like it made, made much sense. So again, if you compare uh, yield, relatively same yields of 96 and 352, or anything with four, um, we do not think that uh, in this case that uh, days after harvest uh, or, or bricks level uh, is related directly to yield. And here's our friend again, the Pinot Noir. Um, and again, you can see that days after harvest is between five and 15 days for things that have exactly the same yield. There's 780 and then 521. So um, again, uh, it, it, we go back to answer the question, is yield correlated with harvest, uh, delayed harvest date? Again, sometimes, but not always. And maybe what we're looking at is just, again, a Pinot Noir effect and not uh, true for other, other varieties, but our other clones of other varieties. Um, but as we'll continue to do more work, I think uh, we, will, we will hone on in, in on whether this is uh, fact with all the Cabernets that Deborah now has in the collection to be a nice chance to start back over and see if that's the, that's the case. Um, so the conclusions for clones is that yield is, is driven primarily by berries per cluster, but again, not, not always, not entirely. Um, we have seen cases where low yielding clones appear to compensate with higher growth uh, and that higher yield can, yield can lead to delayed maturation. Um, and again, we've kind of pruned these and let them alone. We didn't do any cluster adjustments uh, or, or, uh, or thinning uh, in them at all. Right here. Yeah, I just want to say that everyone always likes to hop on a new thing, but as far as global valuation, it's so much more important to find out what the real all-stars are to find the good material. And so this work you're doing is really important. Well, you know, thank you for saying that. Um, it's interesting that we did an international symposium on clonal evaluation. I think it was 95 in Portland, and we brought people in from uh, France and Italy, uh, from Australia, uh, all over the place. And it was interesting that out of that, rather than a renewed uh, uh, excitement about clonal evaluation, I think the conclusion from the group was clonal evaluation is very local, and therefore, you know, why, why do we want to look at one trial when really it's not going to be translatable? I mean, Michael Salachi's experience with things changing uh, as you move the clone around, um, you know, does beg the question of whether we can really get an answer from this or not. And also, um, well, the, other, the other interesting thing was when we did a trial um, 
in, uh, in, in these sparkling wine trials, the very first one we did, we did a tasting. We made, made wines. In that case, we did have funding to make wines, and we did a tasting. And two people walked out of the room, one, one of them saying, this is the clone for me, and so one of them saying, I wouldn't plant this clone if, if, if I had a, you know, had a gun to my head. And it was the same clone. And so what you end up with is situations where clonal work begins to be a lot about style, and so I think that, that we're ideally where we would go, and this, and this is a group I'm, I'm sure has a number of winemakers uh, in, in it, um, no matter how we describe the, the wines when we make them, someone's going to want to taste them. So then that's going to be their gauge as to see whether it has value for their particular wine style or not. So I think ultimately in an ideal program, in a, in a, in a I was going to say Cadillac program, I should probably say Alexis program, but that aside for a second, um, that would be uh, where we would have wines and that we would taste them on a regular basis with people, that they would be well-made, small-lot wines, and then people could walk away and saying, these are the clones that I'm interested in and not those. Um, and I think if we can get there, I think we'll make some major headways. And, and I think, um, I think that, that's going to be an important component uh, to any future success that we, that we get, that, 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 that we uh, aspire to. It's kind of a long-winded answer to your question. Sorry, but uh, how are we doing? Any other questions? No, it's fine. Okay. No other hands. Okay. okay. I think we're good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jim.